Well, this is an idea I'm very excited about, and I've developed this a bit in conversation with Jay Richards, who's a, one of the speakers, and um, some of the other theistic philosophers of science who work on cosmological and design arguments. And um, let, let me go back to what, what it does is it says it, it wants to acknowledge this slide is saying, look, there are ways around the arguments that I made at the end of the lecture. I, I wanted to argue in three different ways the cosmological singularity attested to by the Big Bang evidences and the theory of general relativity point to um, a singularity which could be best explained by a theistic worldview. Um, but if you deny the cosmological singularity, which some quantum cosmologies do, um, then <coughs> you, have, you may get around the kinds of arguments that I made, although I would still say that the, the evidence points to a beginning, though on a quantum cosmology it doesn't absolutely establish it. Um, and here's the idea of quantum cosmology. You have the light cone of the expanding universe stretching out, and inside the tiny, tiny little fraction of time um, corresponding to that point in time when the universe was compressed together and, and it was so small that it could be describable by quantum mechanics, uh, inside that tiny point of time um, it's possible that our deterministic understanding of physics would break down. Thus, a classical theory like general relativity uh, could not be applied in that domain. Okay? That's the claim of uh, the quantum cosmologist. Now, not everyone accepts that interpretation of quantum mechanics. Uh, Peter Hodgson, for example, uh, disputes the idea that determinism breaks down even in that microscopic realm. He takes the uncertainty principle to be a principle of of uh, epistemological uncertainty, not a true indeterminacy. But if you do take the more standard, um, more popular at least, quantum interpretations, then you get the idea that inside Planck time, all that exists is what's called the universal wave function. The, the wave-particle duality idea, you in that idea you have the idea of, a, of uh, a wave function called psi from the Schrodinger equation that would describe all the possible states that could exist for, for matter to exist in. Now, inside that Planck time, the idea is that there is, no, um, there is no matter. You either have energy or just the wave function itself, depending on which quantum cosmology you take. But that wave function then defines all the possible physical states, and that is to say all the possible physical universes that could pop out of that initial um, strange state. So the idea of quantum cosmology as a way around the cosmological singularity is to say that this universal wave function could have self-existed from eternity past. And so you're back to an infinite universe, in a sense. And this would eliminate the need to invoke a transcendent creator as the cause of the universe. Now, um, it, among the, the indeterminacy views of quantum mechanics, there are two basic ones. It turns out both of them it, uh, have theistic implications, even though they do uh, obviate the force of the initial argument that I made. Okay? For, for example, on the quantum or the Copenhagen interpretation of quantum physics, the thing that if you have the universe existing as a wave function describing what is called a superposition of states or possible uh, physical, uh, physical states, you need an observer to collapse that superposition of states or to what's called collapse the wave packet. But since human observers don't exist at that time, um, and this is like way back there, you know, the question is, well, who could exist that could collapse the wave packet? You need literally a cosmic observer, someone that transcends the cosmos to collapse those, that superposition of states into a determinate universe. Now, I don't actually hold this view of quantum cosmology, but those who do, um, or I don't hold this view of quantum physics, but those who use that view to construct a quantum cosmology introduce a new theistic implication uh, inadvertently, in fact. There, many of them are, are self-consciously trying to get around the, the implications of the Big Bang and general relativity when they make this move, but when they do, they actually inf uh, invoke a cosmology or a, a, a quantum interpretation that implies the reality of a cosmic observer. Now, another approach is, another quantum cosmology is the so-called many worlds, there, there are many worlds quantum cosmologies, and this is the approach that Stephen Hawking takes. Hawking doesn't say that you need an observer to collapse that superposition of states into a determinate universe. Rather, he says it may be that every possible state 
described by the wave function, exist in some possible world. Okay? And what he wants to do then is to show, and we can actually kind of go through his pr procedure. What he wants to do, and he does this in the, the book, The Brief History of Time. Many people have read The Brief History of Time and finished without having any idea what it actually is that he is trying to do. <laughs> now, I say that having heard his lectures at Cambridge upon which the book was built and having read the book and initially not having understood what he was trying to do myself. So, and I've got a lot of sympathy. It's taken me a while to, to crack this, but um, in any case, this is what I believe he's trying to do, is that he, he realizes, he, he, he says, look, all the possible states could exist in some possible world. But that doesn't uh, give a satisfying explanation of why our universe is the way it is. So he wants to sum, it's a, it's a mathematical device that Feynman uh, pioneered called the sum over histories. And what he's trying to do is he's trying to sum all the possible histories of the physical states uh, that the wave function could generate to show that ours is the most likely universe out of that ensemble. Or in other words, he wants to add together the superpositions of all the possible states in order to calculate um, the most probable states that could emerge from this wave function, universe as wave function. Okay? Now, when he does that, he, he finds he can't solve the mathematical problems that he's faced in trying to perform this operation without what are called complex variables, the mathematics of imaginary time. So every time there's a time variable, in, he has to replace it with the device of imaginary time. And when he does this, he then performs a mathematical transformation, analyzes uh, the universe as wave function in the mathematical domain of imaginary numbers, and he finds when he does this that the time t equals zero singularity disappears. And it, it goes away in the mathematical representation of the universe. Um, and so he makes quite a lot out of this and says that, um, that, in fact, as long as the universe had a beginning, we would suppose it had a creator. But if the universe is really completely self-contained, having no boundary or edge, it would neither have a beginning nor end. It would simply be. What place then for a creator? Now, as John Polkinghorne pointed out last night, you might still need a creator for reasons other than a temporal beginning. Uh, so this is not knockdown, drag out on Hawking's part in any case. But <clears throat> here he makes um, what Bob Spitzer has called a uh, ontological, ex an extravagant ontological blunder here. Okay? He's really messed up because he wants to turn around and apply this conclusion to the real world. The problem is when he transforms the mathematical description back into the real domain, the domain of real numbers, the singularity reappears. And so you might say on his own logic that in, in, the, in an imaginary world, we don't need God, but in a real world, we do. <laughs> uh, um, uh, that, that's a, a little flip, but the problem is, is, is a really severe one philosophically. Because you can't, he's making an application to the real world of a domain of mathematics which specifically does not apply. It has to be retransformed back into the real world, it's only i minus i squared that has a real expression, um, after all, uh, before you can make any kind of ontological claims about this world. And, and that's, really, that's really the difficulty that he faces. So he admits this. He says, when one goes back to real time in which we live, however, there will still appear to be singularities, indeed the temporal singularity. Only if we lived in imaginary time would we encounter no singularity. In real time, the universe has a beginning and an end at singularities that form a boundary to space-time at which the laws of science do break down. So it seems to me he's in a, re he's in a real fix, that he doesn't actually get, get around um, the singular beginning. Now, if you go back to my slide about the, the, the cosmological trilemma, um, on this, this is really a cognitive map of where I think the, the whole state of cosmology kind of mapping out the, the, the sort of the options you have if you're a naturalist in cosmology. If you go with quantum cosmology, you end up with a number of problems. First of all, the problem that you don't get rid of the singularity, which brings you right back here. Uh, in other words, if you have a temporal singularity, that underwrites an inference to the best explanation type of argument, IBE, for theism. Uh, additionally, there are other kind of problems. He thinks he's getting rid of the boundary constraints uh, the, the need to explain the very fine-tuning of the initial conditions at the beginning. And it turns out that the only way to get the right kind of universe to pop out of the wave function is to arbitrarily constrain the expressions of the wave function. Um, Christopher Isham actually calls it a bounded mini-superspace. 
And so you have to impose these boundary constraints on the wave function itself. You get rid of the temporal boundary conditions and initial conditions, but you reintroduce them elsewhere, which resuscitates the possibility of what they used to be called sufficient reason cosmological arguments. They don't require a temporal beginning, but it's the idea that we have to have some reason why the universe is very finely tuned this way as opposed to all the other things it could be. And what Hawking, there's, there's a little bit of no free lunch type uh, ledger domain here. They're trying to get rid of boundaries in one place and then they pop up someplace else. And the, these, these constraints they imply on the wave function are actually infusions of new information which are entirely unexplained on their model. So this is another a really dif difficulty. Then if you go down the chart though, um, if you take this view of many worlds, that all the possible worlds that could exist do exist, there's two possibilities. You could say that all the physically possible universes exist, that is, all the physically possible states that are consistent with the present laws and uh, fine-tuning parameters of this universe. If you say that, you haven't actually provided an explanation for the fine-tuning of the universe, which we'll hear about more in this, this afternoon, because, um, be, because you, you, you've only got one set of fine-tuning parameters, so you haven't created this infinite array of universes, all with a different set of uh, laws and constants, which can render our universe uh, possible. Uh, alternately, if you say that you've got all logically possible worlds, um, then you play right into the, the teeth of Alvin Plantinga's argument, ontological argument for God's existence, and I'm just not going to explain that now, but Jay Richards is actually quite an expert on this, and it turns out the main naturalistic objection to planning his argument is completely undercut by conceding the existence of all logically possible worlds. So you have a kind of a, it's a pick your poison kind of um, situation, I think, for the naturalists in cosmology, and I think it's a very exciting development in theistic philosophy, because I think there are perils to trying to have silver bullet proofs of God's existence. But if it turns out that by linking arguments, there, you, you know, the, you, you do have ways out of this argument or out of this argument or out of this argument, but if the cost is always by providing grounds for another theistic argument, then it is a very grim situation for philosophical naturalism, as, I, as indeed I think it is, as we, as we are in this you know, wonderful information age and, uh, and so forth. So that was a long answer, but it was a set-up question, so I appreciate it.